Well, it's certainly a great joy to be with everybody tonight, and we're certainly grateful for all of those that, uh, that are here in attendance, a really big crowd. Dr. John Cavadini uh, is director of the McGrath Institute for Church Life at the University of Notre Dame. He is a professor of theology and past chair of the Department of Theology at Notre Dame. In terms of his uh, educational background, he earned a bachelor's at Wesleyan University, followed by graduate studies at Marquette and Yale, leading to uh, the completion of his doctorate. Dr. Cavadini served as chair of the theology department for, uh, for a good number of years, actually. Uh, and during the time that uh, he was chair and also professor, uh, his research and writing have centered most often on the early church. Uh, so including the theology of St. Augustine and St. Gregory the Great, and then also tonight's topic, which is the theology of miracles. Since 2006, he has served as a consultant for the U.S. Bishops' Conference Committee on Doctrine. And in 2009, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI to a five-year term on the International Theological Commission. He recently received a significant honor from the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, who honored him for uh, his significant contribution to the Catholic intellectual life in this country. He has many, many uh, published works. We cannot name them all tonight, uh, but the ones uh, that kind of most appropriate in terms of uh, the topic would be uh, Miracles in Jewish and Christian Antiquity uh, and also some other uh, theological explorations, including the theology of Pope Benedict XVI, uh, a recent book on Mary on the eve of the Second Vatican Council, and then something for seminarians to take note of, uh, in particular, the charism of priestly celibacy. Tonight's lecture is part of the Hesburgh Lecture Series uh, in honor of the past president of Notre Dame, uh, Father Theodore Hesburgh, who was president from 1952 to 1987. So it's jointly sponsored by the Athenaeum of Ohio, Mount St. Mary Seminary, also the University of Notre Dame Alumni Association, and then the Notre Dame Club of Cincinnati. And so we're very, very pleased to be able to collaborate with these groups uh, to bring Dr. Cavadini here tonight. And so welcome, Dr. Cavadini. Thank you. Oh, can everyone hear me? Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Thank you for welcoming me here. It's nice to see everybody. Friends, there's a handout. I'm not sure if I made enough, but maybe you can look on with someone next to you, possibly. Um, some of the material is on, on a slide, but most of it isn't. So the handout contains a little outline of the lecture and also some resources for further reading. So if you, if you didn't get one and you'd like one, we can make some more, we can Xerox some more. Later, I mean. So the topic of miracles, I think is an intrinsically interesting one and kind of endlessly fascinating one. I think people think about miracles a lot, I do. Uh, people pray for miracles, I don't know, I do anyway. Uh, and sometimes they get them. Uh, often not. And so it brings up the question in people's minds, what, it, what, what is a miracle and what is the function of a miracle in Christian, in Christian belief? So I thought I would take this in three parts. The first part, do miracles still happen today? So a, a brief look at some contemporary miracles. And then the second part, What's, what is the theology of the miraculous? So that second part is going to concentrate mainly on the Bible. Miracles in the Bible and how the biblical authors present them to us. And then just a third concluding reflection on miracles in everyday life. Okay? So what is a miracle? Well, I'm not going to define it right now. Uh, partly because... To some extent, a miracle is in the eye of, of the beholder. You can have a very hardcore threshold for the miraculous, uh, the violation of natural law, for instance. But you can also think of other situations that are not so clear as that, 
And yet people involved in the situation might very well say it's a miracle. I'll give you an example. Uh, how about there's a, a situation where there's a, where there's a little kid playing on railroad tracks and his mother uh, all of a sudden sees that this kid is on the tracks and also realizes at the same time that a train is coming, but doesn't have enough time to get there to push the kid off the tracks. So it says a prayer. And what happens is the train comes, but actually slows down and stops just before it, it hits the kid, who maybe didn't notice. I don't know. But afterwards, what's discovered is that the engineer had a heart attack. And it, and it, or something. Let's not say a heart attack. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. So, but the train stops automatically if there's no, foot, if, if there's no um, pressure on the accelerator. And so in some way, it, it's not a violation of natural law. It can be explained perfectly well. On the other hand, the coincidence is something quite wondrous. And I'm sure that the mother felt that she had received a miracle. So I think the reason I don't want to define one right now is that partly a miracle is in the eye of the beholder. However, <clears throat> The biggest rationalist challenge to the possibility of miracles in the modern world came from a guy named David Hume. Anybody ever hear of David Hume? I see all the seminarians have raised their hand. <laughs> David Hume died in 1776. In the 18th century, he was an English philosopher and a skeptic. Uh, and he had a passionate hatred, you might say, of religion and of miracles. Uh, and so he came up with the following challenge. And I wrote it down on the handout, but if you don't have a handout, I'm going to read it out. So what would be enough testimony to convince someone that a miracle had occurred? And for, for Hume, there's a high threshold for miracle. He means an outright violation of natural law. So something that's physically impossible. For example, uh, that... Uh, that this podium would levitate 10 feet off the ground, um, or that if I stepped off of here, I wouldn't fall off the step. And I, I, I wish that would happen, actually, because then you'd say, that was a great lecture, but. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd ask me back. <laughs> but here is Hume's testimony. Uh, and remember that in the background is this high threshold definition of a miracle. It, it involves the violation of a physical law, a natural law. There, there's no testimony sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. Um, to paraphrase, he's saying that you shouldn't believe in any kind of in any kind of um, miracle story, unless it would be more miraculous that the person telling the story is deceived or lying. Now we know that people tend to lie and tend to be deceived, even if they don't mean to lie, so that's a very high threshold, and I think Hume thought it was impossible to meet. So someone tells a miracle story, and should you believe it? Well. Is the miracle more miraculous, or is it more miraculous that the person is lying? You would, you would, you just, you would almost always think it, it would be more miraculous that the person, no, that the miracle occurred, and so you wouldn't believe in it. And so, some of the response to this over the centuries. Uh, has been to try to, to try to, uh, to try to find situations which actually meet Hume's criteria, uh, and it's easier to meet than you might think. But there are two situations uh, from the 20th century, I think, 19th and 20th century, that I'm going to uplift with the idea that it seems to me they absolutely more, do fulfill and more than fulfill the, um, the criteria that Hume laid out. I'm actually not saying we should adopt that criteria, personally, necessarily. But what I am saying is Catholic believers and Catholic theologians 
have tried to find ways or tried to find instances which would meet this challenge. And the two from the 19th and 20th century that seem most obvious to me are Fatima and Lourdes. So I was going to talk about those first. The, uh, we, just, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the apparitions of Our Lady at Fatima to the, to the, um, to the three kids, two of whom were recently beatified by Pope Francis to mark the uh, uh, anniversary. And the story is famous, right? I think everyone knows it, so I won't go through it in detail. <clears throat> but I'm going I'm um, to read enough from this text called Healing Fire of Christ. This is on the syllabus. It's a great book by Father Paul Glynn, which if you'd like to read about contemporary miracles, especially those associated with Lourdes and with Fatima, it's a great read. And I'd encourage you, um, I'd encourage you to, to, uh, to take a look. Seminarians, too. I think in some ways you can, you can overdo miracles, I guess you could say, in our religious faith and in theology, but I've come to the conclusion after teaching for a long time that you can also underdo them. You can also feel, uh, I don't know, too reluctant. Uh, and when, when you look at Fatima or when you look at Lourdes, what, what you see is so striking and it seems therefore so providential providentially provided for an age of unbelief, that it seems irresponsible and indeed anti-intellectual to underplay also. Anyhow, so probably everyone knows that uh, the Blessed Mother appeared to the three kids on six successive 13ths of the month. So starting in uh, May 13th, 1917, ending in October 13, 1917, with one, uh, it, the August date was a little bit off because the children were arrested and were taken into custody uh, and were each threatened with being boiled in oil, uh, among other things. And in fact, they were separately brought off to be boiled in oil, as the other ones thought. Um, but they persisted in their story. So there's a lot of actual genuine heroism, heroism involved in the testimony and the, uh, of the kids. But on July 13th, Our Lady had, had indicated to the, to the children that she would provide a sign that everyone could see. And the day and the hour were predicted. So noon on October 13th. And as October 13th came, people started to gather at the Cova de Aria, the uh, family plot where Our Lady had been appearing. An icy wind swept down on the uplands around Fatima on October 12th. Mists rolled in and then fine rain fell. By nightfall, a big crowd had already squatted down in the Cova de Aria. And uh, so they were willing to come and endure a, a whole night of wind-whipped rain. And you can see the famous picture of uh, people beginning to gather, um, people on October, the people already gathered on October 13th with all their umbrellas up because it was raining. Uh, the Blessed Mother was actually late. Um, <laughs> But I imagine she has things to do. <laughs> it actually depends on how you count time. If you go by solar time, she was on time. Uh, but if you go by watch time, she was late. But she doesn't use watch time. And uh, at a certain point, Lu Lucia told the crowd to put down their umbrellas and to look up at the sun. After some time, Lucia called out, though she did not though she did not later remember doing so, look at the sun. Faces turned up to the sky, and while they watched, the rain ceased and the heavy clouds parted. There's a famous miracle, I mean, um, picture of people watching. The sun appeared, shining brilliantly, but people could look at it directly without the slightest eye strain. For the next 10 to 12 minutes, witnesses later testified, the sun went through 
an extraordinary series of gyrations. The sun began to dance. The secular and atheistic editor of, of one of the newspapers reported. First it whirled around like those fireworks called Catherine wheels. Then it zigzagged erratically across the sky. Rays of light, the colors of the spectrum began to fly out from the sun, bathing people and the landscape in alternating colors. Then I heard a roar of a thousand voices and saw a multitude look up at the sky. Suddenly everything became a purple color. Fearing his eyesight had been affected, this guy, Professor Garrett, covered his eyes with his hands. Just after that, I heard a peasant standing near me exclaim, the lady is yellow, as the dominant color changed again. And then, of course, at one point, the sun seemed to plunge towards the earth, and everyone thought that it was the end of the world. What's especially striking, though, is that not only the 70,000 people gathered there witnessed it, but anyone even 30 miles away sort of looking out their window or coming out into the schoolyard witnessed the same thing. So you can't say it's a group hallucination or anything like that because you didn't even actually have to be there. It was so public and so dramatic. And so the point um, that I'm making here is it, it certainly seems to satisfy Hume's testimony. It's such a dramatic miracle, it would be more miraculous if somehow 70,000 people present were fooled or were deceived and everyone else in the countryside, everyone else in schools around who come out into the schoolyard were also deceived. And friends, it's not only the miracle of the sun, but after that, after it was over, everything was dry. So the roads were dry, clothes were dry. So it wasn't just what was witnessed. It was what, uh, yeah, it was what people, it was physically everything that had, well, you could see how wet everything was. Everything was perfectly dried out. So it seems like there's no possibility of deception, illusion, or, or lying. The next, the next, uh, my next example is, of course, is Lourdes. And many of you may know that there's a thing called the Medical Bureau at Lourdes. Everybody know that? The Medical Bureau was set up precisely to examine claims of miraculous healings. <clears throat> And the reason that there are only about 70 uh, officially accepted miraculous healings is because the, the standards are so stringent. There are certainly many more people healed at Lourdes than, uh, than, the, than the actual official tally. But the, the Medical Bureau was set up, in a sense, to challenge Hume. Maybe it wasn't consciously thought, but it was set up to challenge Hume's criteria. It's, it is very stringent. Anyone who claims a cure has to, have, has to have checked in with them before. Now, of course, that's not because they want to verify a cure. It's because some of them are so sick um, that they're ready to die virtually. And so they check in with the medical bureau for medical care. And then, if they're cured, they have to check back in. They submit to examination. You also have to come back. You also have to send all your medical records and you have to come back the next year and you have to come back five years from then. It's a very involved process and many people don't bother with it. But the, um, the panel of doctors <clears throat> who, 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 who donate their services to the Medical Bureau aren't just Catholic. Uh, there are many of them who are atheist. It's kind of a prestigious thing, I suppose, nowadays to be associated with it. But uh, some people may be associated with it because they want to disprove it. So there's no confessional bias attached to the, to the physicians. And the standard of proof is what? That they all have to agree, or, or some official group of them has to agree, that a particular cure is not explainable by natural causes. So a, a 
appears to be a violation of natural law then. <clears throat> they don't judge that it's a miracle. That's a theological judgment reserved to the bishop of the diocese from where the person came. <clears throat> but I, I chose one of the cases. Many of them are, <clears throat> are in this book by Paul Glynn. They're actually quite unbelievable, some of them. They're so dramatic. This one is among the most dramatic, Pierre de Ruder, who was a peasant who worked on an estate, cutting wood and doing other odd jobs. Uh, and a, a tree fell on his leg and broke the bones of the lower leg, the tibia and the femur. And uh, he went to a doctor who set them, but <clears throat> when he went back to the doctor in a, in, in a few weeks, uh, and the bandages were taken off, the doctor realized it was filled with pus, there had been no healing, and uh, gangrene was beginning to set in. So the doctor advised amputation, but this guy did not want his leg cut off. I don't blame him. Uh, <clears throat> and resisted. He held out for eight years, begging the, um, the viscount, the owner of the estate, to allow him to go to Lourdes. But the owner of the estate the state was a rationalist and didn't believe um, that it would do any good and so wouldn't let him. Uh, he died though. <laughs> no cause effect. <laughs> and his son was more sympathetic. But by that time, eight years later, <clears throat> here's the report that the doctor gave. The doctor noted that the ends of the bones could be seen in the open wound with about an inch separating them. He added this gruesome detail, quote, he had endured this break for eight years. The lower part of the leg could be turned in any direction. The heel could be lifted so as practically to fold the leg in half. The foot could be twisted until the heel was in front and the toes at the back. So it could actually be swiveled all the way around. <clears throat> the, um, the son of the Viscount wouldn't pay for him to go to Lourdes, but did pay for him to go to a local shrine dedicated to Our Lady of Lourdes, which is why it's even more striking. Uh, and for this, these eight years, there were many witnesses of this, of this extreme situation. They got on the train and then took a bus bound for the sh shrine, where the burly bus driver lifted him to the ground. He couldn't believe it when he saw Pierre's left leg swinging. With the insensitivity that sometimes accompanies robust health and size, he said to the people at the bus stop, hey look, here's the man whose leg is coming off. His bouncing laugh stopped when he got into the bus and saw the blood and pus on his floor. He shouted angrily. All this would go into the testimony he gave later. Pierre was tiring badly by now, though the shrine was close by and his wife supported him. He hobbled very slowly and fell exhausted onto a seat in front of the shrine. His wife brought him a cup of water. Another pilgrim accidentally bumped his leg, setting it swinging and causing intense pain. In great distress, Pierre turned his gaze to the face of the virgin statue. Asking pardon for my sins and begging Our Lady of Lourdes, for the grace to be able to earn a livelihood for my wife and children. It's just such a beautiful request. Then suddenly he felt a strange sensation and was upset, shaken, agitated. Forgetting his crutches, inseparable companions for the last eight years, he rose, walked through the rows of pilgrims, and knelt in front of the statue of Mary. Then astonished to find himself kneeling, he cried, I'm on my knees. And... <clears throat> Not only that, but he could jump up and walk around. Normally, even if it had been healed naturally, you would have six months of physical therapy to be able to walk. Huh? The Gospel on Sunday? The man of the sheep gate. Oh, the beautiful gate, yeah. Anyhow, John, Peter, and... Oh, right, yeah, and the Acts of the Apostles. 
Absolutely, yes. Just one more passage here. <clears throat> In a report of, of, this, of this cure, the report pointed out the two bones were separated by more than one inch. Furthermore, the ends had necrosed, died, and were black before the instantaneous joining. That meant nearly two inches of bone were instantaneously added. The weight of phosphate of lime required for this was five grams. However, there are only 1.6 grams in a person's bloodstream. Both the instantaneous nature of the cure and the amount of phosphate of lime suddenly appearing cannot be explained medically. So it's another example, friends, and there he is with his, his legs cured. <clears throat> so it's another example of, of a case where it would be more miraculous, it would seem, that all these witnesses, all the doctors, all the testimony, and all the x-rays were wrong than that the miracle occurred. You'd have to just doubt the structure of reality in order to doubt the miracle. So, for anyone who's come across Hume's challenge, I present these two cases as uh, one as two among many, but two very notable ones that certainly meet that challenge. So you don't have to be afraid, it seems to me, religious believers don't have to be afraid that rationalist philosophers like Hume have somehow disproved the possibility of miracles. It's nothing of the sort. Okay. Ready? Ready. That's the first part. Okay. Now, the second part, what do they mean? What, what do miracles mean? What does it mean that the sun danced and that so many people saw it? And what does it mean that there are these miraculous healings at Lourdes and in other places and other kinds of, of miracles reported? For example, with regard to healings, not everyone who prays is healed. And so... Catholic theology has characterized the meaning of the miraculous as follows. A miracle is a wonder that's a sign. So sometimes we hear the phrase signs and wonders. But um, strictly speaking, a miracle is a wonder which signifies something beyond itself. So if I were to walk off of here, <laughs> it didn't work, <laughs> and pray that I not, um, what, would it, what would it be a sign of? It would just be a random wonder, except maybe it would feed my pride, uh, and that's actually demonic. So there are demonic prodigies, um, which mimic miracles, but the whole point of a demonic prodigy is just to fix your attention on the prodigy and be dazzled, because evil always wants you to look at it and to stare and be mesmerized. So a wonder that only draws attention to itself as such, just to amaze, isn't what Catholic theology or Catholic believers think of as a miracle. In some way, the miracle is transparent as a wonder to something else, which therefore must be a greater wonder. If something is dramatic, as, um, as this healing, for example, as something as wondrous as that is only a sign. It means that the miracle functions properly when it's relativized by that which it points to. And it seems to me that that's the way the Bible handles the miraculous. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. In, in the Catholic Church, there are two economies of sign, miracle and sacrament. And I kind of have a kind of clever, it's too clever by half, don't laugh though. Um, <laughs> a miracle is a wonder that's a sign, and a sacrament is a sign that's a wonder. <laughs> How do you like that one? Okay, so second part of the talk then, what is a biblical theology of the miraculous? <clears throat> and so if we can figure out what the biblical theology of the miraculous is, we can also talk about the meaning of the miracles at Lourdes and others that, that we um, 
that we may have experienced or that we may hear about. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I put the grotto up because we can sometimes forget at Notre Dame that it's, it's not our grotto. <laughs> the grotto is a Lord's grotto. And so Notre Dame has a, has a connection to all of these mir miracles, miraculous healings at Lourdes on our, on our very own campus. Okay, so <clears throat> if you don't have a handout, this part of the talk is divided in two. I'm going to work a little bit with the Gospel of John, and then I'm going to work a little bit with the Gospel of Mark. Okay, so first the Gospel of John. People sometimes, I think, reading the Gospels or just hearing them read on Sundays, they have the impression that uh, miracles are randomly distributed in the Gospels, or just a lot of them, maybe. But the Gospel of John is very careful about how many miracles it presents. There are seven. And often uh, commentators on the Gospel of John call these the seven signs. And they call the first part of the Gospel, which contains all of these seven miracles, the Book of Signs. And all of them will be familiar to you. They're on the handout, but I'll just call them to mind. The Wedding Feast at Cana, Jesus changes water into wine. The healing of the official son. <clears throat> the healing at the pool of the sheep gate, which I was confusing with the one you were bringing up. <clears throat> the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus walks on water. The healing of the man born blind. And finally, the raising of Lazarus. And all of these miracles are called signs because they're not self-contained. They refer to something else. So think about it. The, the miracle of the water turned into wine occurs at a wedding feast. The miracle... Uh, but what's it a sign of? It's certainly a sign of the power of Jesus. But it's also a sign of the glory of Jesus, which is not the same as his power, necessarily. Because Jesus dies on the cross, Jesus on the, uh, Jesus when he multiplies, I mean when he makes water into wine, he makes it into wine spectator 100 wine, right? <laughs> they weren't rating them then, but I'm sure it would get 100 in wine spectator, because it says you've saved the best wine till now. <clears throat> but when he dies on the cross in the Gospel of John, what does he get on a sponge? Vinegar, which is sour wine. So the true bridegroom is Jesus, who at his wedding, you might say, wedding the church on the cross, receives only sour wine. And the glory of the bridegroom, of the true bridegroom, the true spouse, is that he's willing, despite the fact that he's the word made flesh, to, to die on the cross out of love for the bride, for the church. And so the sign of the water turned into wine is a sign of the, true, of the love of the true bridegroom, which will come later in the text. Anyway, but the point is, right, as wondrous as the actual turning of water into wine is, it's only a sign of that which is more wonderful, the true bridegroom who came to give his life for the bride, the church. Okay, and I thought I'd, <clears throat> I'd go over one of these miracles a little more closely uh, the healing of the man born blind. I don't know if you can read that. If you can't, it's okay. I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm just going to read parts of it and comment on it. Okay, are you game? Ready? As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. <clears throat> and his disciples asked him, <clears throat> Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Sorry. I did this beforehand, but it, just, it seems to have screwed itself back on. A miracle. <laughs> mm.
Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be manifest through him. <clears throat> we must work the works of him who, co- who sent me while it is day, night comes, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So the gospel writer puts that saying of Jesus right up front, so you already know what the miracle is a sign of. The miracle of the man born blind receiving his sign is a sign of the, of the wonder of Jesus as the light of this world. <clears throat> the miracle points to him <clears throat> and helps us understand who he is and what he does for us. <clears throat> as he said this, he spat on the ground, <clears throat> made clay of the spittle, <clears throat> and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. It's worth pausing there. Who in the Gospel of John is the one who's sent. Who? In the Gospel of John? Well, if you read up there, we must work the works of him who sent me. Jesus is the one sent in the Gospel of John. So it isn't interesting that the Gospel writer pauses to tell us the name of of the pool in which he's supposed to wash, Siloam. Why would he bother to tell us unless it's significant for the reader? So it's an image of baptism. That's where you go and wash, are washed, in the one who was sent, and, and you come back seeing. In the early church, baptism was called the Sacrament of Enlightenment. And so, and the newly baptized were called the Illuminati, those who could now see, those who had been illuminated. So, baptism gives you the light of Christ. So, the the actual mechanism of the miracle, washing in the pool, is also an image of baptism. Who is the man born blind? John is perfectly capable of naming names. But he doesn't give the name of the man born blind. Who is it? It's all of us. All of us are born blind, spiritually. And baptism is the way in which the light of Christ comes to us and enlightens our whole life. So already we can see that the physical miracle, as wondrous as it is, what the gospel writer is saying to us is that that extreme physical wonder is only a sign of a greater wonder, if you would think about it, which is your own baptism, when Christ came into your life as the light of the world, as the light of your world. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He said, I am the man. So notice, it's like the course of the Christian life after baptism, right? You have to make a confession. And the man born blind who sees is willing to say, is willing to bear witness, I'm the man. What happens? Gets him in trouble. Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Then the Pharisees questioned him and accused, uh, well, the, the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. 
And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? So it's, you can see that it's an actual literal sign. It's a physical sign that we're talking about. We're not just talking about an allegory. <clears throat> we're talking about a physical sign which nevertheless has a meaning, is pointing to Jesus as the light of the world and what he does for us when we allow that light to enlighten us. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. It's like the medical bureau at Lourdes. <laughs> Ask him, he's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So the Christian life after baptism isn't one of sitting around, it's one in which we're called upon to bear witness. Increasingly, notice how in the story, the ante keeps getting raised. So for the second time, they call the man who had been born blind, they cross-examine him again. How did you open your eyes? I told you already and you would, you would not listen. Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. So it's a physical miracle. You can't lose track of that. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. So he bore witness even to the point of being cast out. It's so beautiful, friends. Guess who he finds when he's been cast out? He finds Jesus waiting for him. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So, the man born blind, in one sense, doesn't fully see until he realizes fully who Jesus is and worships him as more than a prophet, which he had called him earlier in the text. But also, the man born blind, when he was cast out at the point you would think you were most desolate and alone, that's where he finds Jesus. And so understands fully the meaning of Jesus as the light of the world, that Jesus is present in those moments of desperation where we thought we were alone, and that that wondrous love, that wondrous love of stooping down even though he's the eternal son of God through whom all the whole world was created, that that wondrous love is what the miracle pointed to. You can notice, friends, also if you think about the story, that a lot of times we approach the miraculous, I think, as though it would solve all our problems if we could see a miracle or receive a miracle that somehow this is going to make my life easier. Because what we're thinking in the back of our minds is that if we could see a miracle, we wouldn't need faith anymore. As though seeing a miracle would obviate faith. But a true miracle never obviates faith. A true miracle, as opposed to a demonic prodigy, a true miracle invites you to faith. Precisely faith. And you can see that in the story. Was his life made easier by that very dramatic miracle? It was absolutely not made easier 
it was made more difficult because he had to testify. And it caused a controversy. So there were people who, who knew what had happened, who had witnessed it, but refused, refused to realize, refused to accept, how's this, the challenge that that miracle presented. A biblical miracle and a true miracle after the pattern of a biblical miracle never forces you to believe. It always invites belief. It always leaves you free because you have to have that moment of freedom to say, yes, who is he, Lord? Who is he that I serve, that I might believe in him? He's standing right here. And then he decides, right, out of gratitude to worship. So you get the idea, I think, from considering this, this passage. And the gospel writer is also addressing Christians who have been baptized and might underestimate their baptism, saying that what this is is nothing less than having been born blind spiritually, you now see. And the, the miracle of the, the physical healing of the man born blind, as wondrous as it is, the gospel writer is saying, is only a sign to that work that Jesus does in us, in baptism, and all along the way of the Christian life as, as baptized Christians. But notice how important it is that it's a physical miracle, and it's not just um, an illusion. And that's emphasized throughout the story that it actually happened. So, so that precisely the point is made that whatever it's a sign of is an even greater wonder. Okay, ready to go on to the Gospel of Mark? Okay, the Gospel of Mark, uh, most people believe, is, is earlier than the Gospel of John. But, but that's not really, a, um, I don't know why I said that. I, I guess I said it because I'm going backwards according to the way some people might think. Once again, I think we can approach a Gospel, like the Gospel of Mark in this case, and we have the impression somehow that the miracle stories in the gospel are, are evenly distributed, are spread out, or just come up at random whenever the evangelist felt like it. He threw one in. It's actually very carefully planned by the evangelist. And I, if you look at your handout, I've tried to illustrate this. The, the gospel is divided into, into three sections. Almost all of the miracles occur in the first section of the gospel, which is verse 1.1 to verse 8.26. I think there are only four other miracles outside of that first section of the gospel. There are three in the second section. So there's the first section of the gospel, which really is characterized by this avalanche of miraculous deeds that Jesus works, one after another. That's why the Gospel of Mark has that style. And immediately he was here, and immediately he was there, and then this, and then this. People think of it as a very primitive style. It's actually a very sophisticated style because the impression it gives is one thing after another. And that's the impression it's intended to give. The middle section of the Gospel uh, is the section containing the passion predictions. There are three passion predictions in the Gospel of Mark. The third section of the gospel is the, is the passion itself. Uh, and there's only one miracle in the whole long story of the passion and the way to Jerusalem and it's the cursing of the fig tree. That odd miracle, maybe you've wondered at it. Uh, but if you think about it, it's, the evangelist highlights the way in which the, the um, fig tree has no fruit, is sterile, and is cursed, therefore, and in, in, the, in the passion narrative in Mark, it seems like all of his disciples are sterile. They've borne no fruit, and they all leave him, including the big cheese, P. 
Peter, um, who has said he's, he'll always stick with him, but denies him three times. So, the placement of the miracles is, from this point of view, strategic. Think about it this way. The Gospel of Mark was written at a time maybe when we're into the second or third generation of Christians and maybe there are people who are like John C. Cavadini um, who are thinking, yeah, right. You know what? You saw all these things. Whatever. You saw all these healings. You saw this miracle and that one. I didn't see anything. So I'll see it when I believe. I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. How's that? Fine. The gospel writer says, okay, John C. Cavadini, smarty. Think you're so smart, you have a PhD. <laughs> Come over here uh, and read through all of these people who saw the most astonishing deeds which include, if you'll recall, in the Gospel of Mark, the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000, the, the raising of the widow's son from, from death to life, many dramatic cures and exorcisms, the walking on the water, the calming of the wind and the waves. They saw all these things and guess what? They abandoned Jesus. At the drop of a hat, they abandoned him. All of them. And not only that, they couldn't even stay awake while he was praying. So, is it true, John C. Cavadini and any other reader of the Gospel, that all you need is a miracle, and then you would believe? If you could see it, you'd believe? These people all saw and they didn't actually believe. Unlike the man born blind in the Gospel of John, they didn't. So the, so the Gospel writer is cautioning anyone, once again, who has this attitude that if I could see a miracle, I wouldn't need faith. Because that's what really you mean when you say, if I could see it, I'd believe it. What you're really meaning is, if I could see it, I wouldn't have to believe. I wouldn't need faith. Or, or, or else you have a very inadequate or immature form of faith, because even though Peter does confess in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is the Christ, when Jesus predicts the Passion the first time right in that passage, um, he tells Peter to get, be he rebukes him and tells him to get behind me, Satan. It's not exactly a compliment to be called Satan. I don't think. So, obviously, Peter's faith, based on what he's seen, isn't true faith yet. So then, how do the miracles function? Are they superfluous? Are they just distractions? Once again, friends, in order to understand the way the miracles function in the Gospel of Mark, just as in the Gospel of John, you have to invoke the notion of sign. The miracles are a sign of something beyond themselves. And the reason that the disciples all fall away is that they haven't seen what, they haven't realized what the miracles point to. And I want to show you how it works by studying a couple of texts in the Gospel of Mark. Don't worry, I won't tax your patience too long, but I, I think it might be fun to do this. Are you game? Oh, okay. I'll come back to that. I, I want to I focus on one miracle. It's the most dramatic one in the gospel, I think. It's the calming of the wind and the waves. I, my Bible is falling apart. Okay, so I'm going to read it from the text. 
and comment. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the, in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. You're familiar with the story. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So I I focus on this particular miracle, friends, because it's the only place where the evangelist reports the disciples asking this question, who then is this, that even the wind and the seas obey him? And so the question is meant, we're meant to ask it too as readers. But why is it that the question is placed here? Not, for example, when the widow's son is raised from the dead. Who then is this that can raise the dead? Or when the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, who then is this that can multiply matter? Well, they didn't have that word. Well, they did, but never mind. (laughs) That can multiply bread, stuff, in violation of natural (laughs) law. They didn't think that either. Why? Okay, I'm going to go to another biblical text to compare to this one to explain why. And this is Psalm 107, 23 through 30. These references are on... Well, maybe they're not. Anyway, Psalm 107, 23 to 30. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Sound familiar? Of all the miracles that Jesus works in the Gospel of Mark, the only miracle that's reserved to God alone in the Old Testament is the calming of the wind and the waves. So, Elisha raises the dead and also multiplies oil and bread. Bread too? Did I get that right? Anyway, he multiplies stuff. Um, It's true that at the splitting of the sea, Moses raised his staff, but it's God who brings the east wind and and arranges that that, uh, particular scenario of the wall of water on the left and on the right. So it's only God who performs who calms the wind and the waves. And Jesus, you'll recall, in the passage of the Gospel of Mark, doesn't pray. He just does it, right? He has the divine power at his command. And so this is the way that the Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus is divine. I don't believe in, in, I, I don't believe the theorists that say that Mark has a low Christology. Because Mark doesn't do it the way a clunky professor like John C. Cavadini does and is. I mean, I would write like a treatise. On the hypothesis of the one person, of the two natures in Christ, which I believe in, don't worry. But if that's what we're reading in the gospel, no one would read it. The whole point is Mark identifies Jesus by the story. 
by writing it such a way that, that it echoes this psalm so that you know that all, anyone who's familiar with the Old Testament knows that it's only God who can do this, and so that Jesus, in some sense, is, is divine, is God. All right, so let's look at one more passage. This is his prey in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can kind of read this with new eyes if you read it fresh off of a reading of these two other passages. Don't you? Because you know that the person in the garden has divine power, is God in some way, and can command the wind and the waves. And they went to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. It's a very poignant scene, friends, if you keep in mind that he has the power to make this hour pass from himself. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to thee. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he came and found them sleeping, barren like the fig tree, seemingly. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. <clears throat> the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. John C. Cavadini thinks that if he could see, he would believe. They saw, and they couldn't even stay awake. They saw these things. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So friends, as I suggested, you, you, you hear this passage differently if you approach it remembering that the person praying is divine. He commands the wind and the waves. And frankly, if it were me, I would command a few wind and the waves right then and there. Blow these people away. I wouldn't say it, I'd just do it. It's a good thing I'm not the son of man. Because we never would have been redeemed. <laughs> but, in the, in the middle part of the gospel, at the end of the third passion prediction, Jesus says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So how does it work? How does the miracle work? It works this way. This person, who is evidently undergoing desolation, that we all can recognize, it's so familiar, right? Have you ever felt desolate? It's the very same desolation and, and abandonment we feel. And in this case, maybe Jesus thought as a human being in his human consciousness that his mission had failed. His closest disciples that he'd worked with all this time and done these great deeds couldn't even stay awake and were going to be scattered. And so that's a moment of great desolation. Have you ever prayed for a miracle and not gotten one? I have. Guess what? You're in good company. Right here. 
And the prayer rings true. So how does the miracle work? The miracle doesn't work by getting us to hope that if we could only see one, then we wouldn't need faith. We'd believe, meaning we wouldn't need faith. The miracle works this way. No matter how desolate you are, how abandoned, whatever desolate landscape you're walking, or even moonscape, more desolate, all of a sudden you look and there's a footprint ahead of you. It's like, whoa, somebody was here before. And guess who it was? It's the creator of the world. It's the word made flesh. It's the one who commands the wind and the waves. What wondrous love is this? Oh my soul, oh my soul, that bent down this far to experience abandonment that, that's my abandonment and to experience forsakenness that's my forsakenness. To take that up so that even in a moment of forsakenness, I'm not alone, actually. I'm not forsaken. All of my experience has been taken up into his love. And so there is no point of my life, of human life, no matter how empty it seems or desolate or abandoned, that is not an intimate accompaniment that is in which we're not intimately accompanied. And it, and it doesn't mean that when you feel forsaken, you have to take a little like mental mystical vacation and feel accompanied and then go back to desolation. The point is, your desolation is where Jesus meets you. So that the miracle allows you it, it, it invites faith in the wondrous love, the love that's more wondrous than the calming of the wind and the waves. What could be more wondrous than that? It's the love of the Creator who emptied himself, bent down, joined in our forsakenness to redeem it, to lift it into himself and his love so that our faith is strengthened and that there is no moment of our life that we don't experience his companionship. So see how the miracle works properly? It works as a sign of something greater than the physical wonder. In this case, the wonder of the Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That wondrous love is what the miracles are signs of. And that explains, in a sense, friends, why you could say, well, why didn't Jesus heal all the sick? Or why doesn't everybody who prays to be healed be healed? It's because the miracle is a sign. And a miraculous healing is not a sign just for the person healed. It's a sign for everyone. What's it a sign of? Let's think of the, of the healings at Lourdes. The healings at Lourdes are signs of the greater restoration to health that God will work for us, which is salvation. Because as difficult as it is, I guess, to, to realize, a re anyone returned to physical health is going to die anyway. Um, they're not saved by being returned to physical health. They're saved by Jesus by his wondrous love, which destines us for something eternal. And the miraculous healing, you could say, is a sign of that greater healing. It's an encouragement to believe you aren't abandoned, even in your sickness, even and especially if you're not cured miraculously. It's why, the, it's why miracles are disperse seemingly gratuitously. They aren't based on the virtue of the person receiving the miracle. Because they aren't a reward for virtue. Uh, you, and you can, well, I think you can say that there is a kind of exhibited, a preferential option for the poor and for the helpless. 
So John C. Cavadini, if I were God, I would heal all the rich and famous people. <laughs> because, because I would think, well, then everybody will they'll notice and believe them. But what does that say about God? He loves the rich and famous <laughs> better than anybody. So, but there is, um, and I think if you look at the Lord's miracles, a kind of preferential often for the poor, because the poor are all of us without anything. They're just us. God loves us. He doesn't love our status, our money, or anything else. Not that they're bad, but he doesn't love us for those things. Okay, so there's the second part of the talk. Don't worry, the third part's a lot shorter. But get the idea? The miracle's a sign. It's a wonder that's a sign. Okay, third point. This is a concluding reflection. One function, and maybe the largest function, of the miraculous is in a sense to reawaken our sense of wonder at everything that God does and has done. So, St. Augustine is, is, uh, is one of the most famous expositors of this kind of a theme. He talks about the miracle of the raising of Lazarus. He's got several sermons on this. And he points out that which is more miraculous or more wondrous that someone who is raised from the dead who already existed or that someone who never existed comes into this world. It's actually the latter that's more wondrous, that someone who never existed seemingly comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden is there. I used to ask my kids, I have seven kids, they used to get tired of this. I used to ask them, where did you come from? (laughs) But I honestly meant it. You look at them and think, where where did, like, I know where you came from in one sense, but like, where did you, who are a you, where did that you come from? Like, I didn't do that, or whatever. And they used to think I was crazy, asking them that. But I caught one of them asking her kid that. <laughs> but St. Augustine says, because, because one is so ordinary, we've lost a sense that it's wondrous. So in, in that case, the idea of the miracle, as it were, the strictly speaking miracle, is to sort of jumpstart our sense of wonder at all that God does that we, that we don't wonder at. I don't know um, if, you, if you know, St. Bernadette is one of my favorite saints. And you know, they exhumed her three times. Uh, and when they first exhumed her, I think it was 40 years after she was buried. Uh, and um, they didn't, well, they, they exhumed her. And, Examine the body, and it was incorrupt. She's one of the most incorrupt of all the incorrupt. Some of them are a little iffy. But, I'd say. but she's like, and it was, her liver was soft. Like the liver is the first thing to go. It either gets mummified or it gets crumbled. Or into, all right, so what's God saying? I care about livers? Well, yes. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, look, my care does extend to the body. The body is not just a thing. But that miracle of the, that preservation, it tends to cast its light over all bodies, not just Bernadette's then. It's a sign that God cares about everyone, not just their spirit, but their body, which also will be redeemed. Of course, An incorrupt body is not redeemed as such, but it's a sign to all people that the body is included in God's love. And so it returns a dimension of wonder to the body itself. Even if you think about some of the miracles we've seen in the Bible, to the extent that that Jesus cared to heal the sick, that Jesus cared to make them whole, is a sign that 
everything that God has created is precious. I'm going to read you one more brief passage. This is the, from the feeding of the 4,000 in the Gospel of Mark. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. Does that way of talking sound familiar? It echoes the language of the institution of the Eucharist, doesn't it? And it's intended to. So the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 is a sign of the, of the greater wonder of the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is what? It's the sacrament of the self-giving, wondrous love of the incarnate Word. The Eucharist, the feeding of the 5,000, the miracle, is a sign of something greater than the miracle. The Eucharist, which is Jesus himself offering himself in every Mass, that Eucharist truly presents the wondrous love of which the miracle was only a sign. The miracle is a sign of that love. The sacrament actually presents that love. And that means, friends, to the extent that we live the Eucharistic life, the life which is you know, receives communion, which goes to Mass regularly, receives the body and blood of Jesus Christ, is received into communion with his love, that person is receiving the most wondrous thing there is. What wondrous love is this? O oh my soul, O oh my soul. And the Eucharistic life, in communion with the most wondrous thing, the Eucharistic life, the person living that life, begins to see everything differently. Begins to see everything from the perspective of that wondrous love. So that the whole world is reinvested with wonder. Because the whole world came out of that love. And so, to the extent that you can think of the miraculous as wonders, that are signs of the wondrous love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And, 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 and go to communion with that in mind. What you're realizing little by little is what that wondrous love loved you. And everyone receiving communion, and everyone is subject of that love, so you begin to see everything in the light of that love, which goes back to our work on the man born blind. Jesus is the light of the world. The light of the world is that love, and in that light, everything that God has done and created is a miracle. Thank you. questions if you want me to or if it's too late it's up to you okay um, we just have a moment for just a couple questions so uh, I think we have a couple microphones circulating pardon me um, Mr. Hume die skeptic sorry I didn't hear you Mr. Hume. Oh, did he die a skeptic? Yes. He did. All his research. Hume is the uh, kind of art skeptic. And the skeptical. No one out skeptic him. <laughs> <laughs> no.
Thank you very much, Professor. That was very enlightening. Um, it dawned on me, listening to your presentation, that it seems to be maybe a bit paradoxical that, uh, especially when you're speaking of the, the committee that was over there at Lourdes and all the people who Hume, uh, who doubt the possibility of miracles, on the one hand, if a miracle is a sign to, a wonder that points to a sign, if you doubt the possibility of a miracle, how can you arrive at that which is signified? It seems a bit paradoxical to me. Okay, so first of all, I want to, I want to echo something I said in the talk, which was a genuine miracle never forces you to believe. It always leaves you free. At a certain point, it almost offends, re it does offend reason not to believe, it seems to me. If you read around in the lit philosophical literature on miracles, there are people who, who show there's a certain point where it's more reasonable to believe in the miracle than to hold out. Because you can always say, well, I'm going to hold out for a natural explanation, right? There's the famous case of Alexis Carroll. I don't know if you know who he is. He's, um, his story is told in this book, The Healing Fire of Christ. He's a Nobel-winning heart surgeon who, um, who, is, who is an atheist in France. But he heard about Lourdes at the end of the 19th century. And he went to Lourdes and uh, witnessed before his eyes one of the most dramatic cures, he saw someone's um, cancerous sore knit together in, a, in one minute. He watched it happen. He watched the healing happen with, within the space of one minute. And his reaction was, there must be a natural explanation. And so he kept going back to Lourdes to watch. And he, he did witness, because he kept going back, a couple of other... Um, and he wrote about it, not believing, but thinking that there, there would be some natu natural explanation. But he, even that, in the rationalistic temperament of France at the time, caused him to be expelled from the scientific society that he was, so he came to the United States. Uh, and he got, his, he got his Nobel Prize when he was in, <laughs> in the United States. But eventually he, 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 um, he believed. It took him till his, his whole life. But he received the sacraments before he died and came to the conclusion that there was no other explanation except for the fact that people prayed and their prayers were heard. So you can hold out. It's not a proof. But if you take Alexis Carroll's story, you see how a true miracle works. It works on you. It doesn't make your life comfortable. It challenged him. And under the influence of God's grace, his, his heart opened. Because the, but it's because the miracles were so striking. And yet, anyone could hold out. But, it, but the, the point is, it, it's just like the, um, the first preaching of the word to someone. They might resist it. You see how they're similar things? That's what we mean when we say the miracle is a sign. It's like a speech of God. It's like, it's like a word of God or a speech act of God. It's addressed to you. What are you going to do? Are you going to... It's, but it's never a proof in the sense that it's a, a mathematical kind of... Um, it, it doesn't prove the faith. It invites you to faith. Precisely faith. Because if a faith could be proven, like a mathematical proof, it wouldn't be faith. And what, and what you believe in would actually be lost. I, I give this example. If you could prove that someone loves you, prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, it wouldn't be love. It would disappear. Because love is free. True love. And something that's free has no other cause besides its freedom. So if you could actually prove that somebody loves you, watch, you know, 
it's because of this force or that force or this molecule or whatever, you would actually cause to disappear the love you were believing in. So, same thing with a miracle. If you could prove it, you would make it so God didn't exist. In a sense, anyway. Rough analogy. I was wondering how long it generally takes for the church to um, recognize a miracle or say that, you know, yet like with Lords, like obviously a lot of people believe right away. Okay, so how long does it take the church to, to make the decision that a miracle occurred? So, um, just two things. You can believe a miracle on your own. Right? So the church doesn't, doesn't um, publicly proclaim miracles and, and by doing that, disqualify all the other miracles people may believe in. That's not the point of it. The point of it is that uh, it is to, is to make sure that claims about the miraculous that are brought forward, for example, on behalf of the canonization of a saint, aren't frivolous, right? So that these claims have been examined. You know, a good thing which I didn't put on the handout, uh, Ken Woodward has a book called Making Saints, and he's a chapter in there about the process for verifying miracles. It's actually fascinating. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of arguments about how long it takes. People, 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 people say, well, it takes too long, and we shouldn't have this process, or, or people insist, no, we need it. So there are arguments about this, but the, the essence of it is to make sure that a, a claim of the miraculous is just is not frivolous or um, so that in some sense it does meet Hume's criteria. Some do, but that's not the criteria for an individual at all. And by the way, the church, the church may rec formally recognize certain miracles, but you're not required to believe in any one of them as a matter of the Catholic faith. You are, as a matter of the Catholic faith, required to believe that God does work miracles. But you don't have to believe in any individual one. Maybe one more question. Well, that's the point of the miracle being a sign. It was a sign for you. And, um, and it's okay to tell the story. And people will react as, as they see fit. The, like if we, if, we, if we look at the Gospels, they're, they're telling you not to be fixated on the miracles simply as amazing events, but be open to what they point to and let that work on your heart. So I think that's probably the right way of doing it. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks everybody for... Um... <laughs> Obviously very spiritually rich uh, and fascinating presentation. So I know Dr. Cavadini is willing to stay behind for a few moments for anyone uh, that wishes to, to ask an additional question. Uh, do know that there are these... Uh, kind of uh, cards at your places. If you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, possibly uh, put out down your address so you can receive our magazine, let us know. Uh, but uh, certainly have a great night and thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Yeah. With the church, are the miracles that they do recognize instantaneous? Because in my personal